Uh, so I want to talk about something a little bit different, and I'm also coming from a, a different viewpoint. So I'm not an entrepreneur. Uh, I do things that are only vaguely relevant to the real world, uh, but I try to figure out stuff that might potentially be relevant. So I'm a law professor, and so I think about innovation in the life sciences. And in particular, what I've been thinking about a lot these days is the use of really complex, opaque algorithms in medicine. So the scenario that I think will be happening in the not too distant future is something like this. You go into your doctor's office uh, and your doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you this, I have some bad news. You are at a slightly increased risk of stroke, um, but to try to decrease that risk, we'd like you to take a small dose of an antidepressant every day and that'll decrease your risk, at least we think so. We don't have any idea why we think you're at an increased risk and we don't know why we think the drug will help. But we've got great computer algorithms that say that it will, and we're going to trust them. And so this is black box medicine, the idea that we can help make medical, machines can help us make uh, medical decisions by using kind of big data in health and can improve the way we do medicine, uh, but in a way that's non-opaque or non-transparent and is opaque and that we don't really understand. And so the question is, how? If at all, do we re regulate medicine where we don't, and in fact, where we can't know how it works? So I want to take a step back a little bit and talk about a little bit more about what black box medicine is and why, we, why it might be a good thing, and then I'll turn to the regulatory side of things, and I'll try a little bit on the fly, we'll see how this goes, uh, to fit it into the framework that Adam's been talking about and laid out. Okay, so why do we want this kind of stuff? Uh, well, the answer is pretty simple, actually, and it's this. Uh, biology is complicated, like really, really wildly complicated. Human bodies are full of just immense numbers of networks of proteins and cells and genes uh, and gene expression and RNA, and everything interacts in this tremendously complicated fact fashion, and that's just when you're going around living. When you add in things like aging and diseases and infectious pathogens and what you eat and what you do every day, it gets wildly complicated. The challenge is, the way that we do medicine and the way that we demonstrate that medical techniques work and that we develop them is almost laughably simple. We try to understand stuff explicitly, and don't get me wrong, it's awesome. I spent lots of years in a lab trying to figure this stuff out. I have tremendous respect for biomedical scientists, but the process of slowly making incremental steps in how we understand the way bodies work and the way medical technology works on that is incredibly slow. And the way we try to validate that for use is clinical trials where you basically take a bunch of people and you separate them into two groups and you give half of them the treatment and half of them you don't give the treatment and you see if on average the half that got the treatment got better. That's great for telling you that it works on average, but it's really bad about telling you why it does or doesn't work for individual people. And it turns out a lot of things work really differently for different people. So one answer to this essential conundrum is to say, well, eventually we'll get there and decades or hundreds of years from now, we will have figured it all out, and let's wait until then. Unsurprisingly, I think this is not kind of the way to go, uh, and what looks to be a shortcut now is to say, well, hey, we've got so much data. We have so much data about health. Electronic health records, genomic sequencing, metabolite screens, all this stuff that's giving us data about how people are, Fitbits, that kind of stuff, Google searches, all this information about your health. And we're increasingly getting really powerful machine learning algorithms that can find patterns in data without even knowing what they're looking for. So the example I used to like to use, and I used frequently, is Google Images. You can search Google Images for a duck and it will show you lots of pictures of ducks. That's not because it knows what a duck looks like or because it has some set of rules for this is a duck. It's because that machine learning uh, technique has been trained and has seen millions of pictures of ducks and billions of pictures of things that aren't ducks. And so it knows what a duck looks like by experience in the same way that human doctors can say, oh, that's cancer. You know, don't know why, can't tell you the rule, but I know it when I see it and that's cancer. So we're getting there. And I, I, don't, I don't want to be clear, by the way, this thing is, this is starting to happen. It's not happening yet, but it's coming. And so the question is, well, how do we regulate it? And so first I want to say what kind of FDA is doing in this space right now and what it looks like they're thinking about. And then I want to talk about whether or not that seems like it's good or there are problems. So right now, well, I'll give it away. I'm a little concerned because I think FDA is leaning towards saying this is like all the other stuff that we see. And FDA is big on saying 
prove to me that this works and why this works in a very rigorous, pretty slow, pretty expensive fashion before I'm going to let it on the market. And so the I think the most relevant story, and again, this is somewhat on the horizon, so FDA hasn't explicitly said this is how we're going to deal with black box medicine, uh, but the closest story is that of laboratory developed tests. So starting about 30 years ago or so, FDA got the authority to regulate diagnostic tests. These are the kind of things that say, oh, you've got strep throat. And what they said was, if you want to sell a kit to test somebody for strep throat, well, then we want to approve that. And if it's something really new, we want clinical trials. And if it's something that's like a, something that we've already said is OK, we just want you to show us that it's like that other thing. But they said, there are a bunch of tests that people do kind of in their own hospital or in their own lab. And they develop it themselves, and they run it themselves. And they say, these laboratory-developed tests, or LDTs, we're not going to worry about those so much. Those are the kind of thing that you can innovate freely on, and you're not, we're going to exercise enforcement discretion, we're not going to come after you for that. And as a result, unsurprisingly, we got tons and tons and tons of LDTs, many, many more than we got these diagnostic kits. Well, the summer before last, FDA said, this isn't really working for us anymore. Uh, we're concerned that LDTs are getting too complicated, and that people are doing too much complicated stuff in these laboratory developed tests. So instead, we're going to fold them back into everything else. And we want to go through the same sort of risk-based review where we want clinical trials or demonstrating that it's just like something else that's already on the market. And in particular, one of the things they said that really caught my eye was for tests that involve non-transparent algorithms and make diagnoses, we think that's going to fit into the highest category of risk. And that's the kind of stuff where we're going to want a full set of clinical trials before we're willing to approve it. So that, to me, sounds a lot like new, flexible, black box medical algorithms. And so I'm really concerned that what the agency is doing is going to say, uh, this is the kind of stuff where we want you to prove how it works. We want you to run clinical trials before we get there. And I'm concerned that is the potential to really stop this technology in its tracks. All right, so that's one side of things. That's what I think is going on now. Well, let's turn to the flip side and say, well, do I buy Adam's point? Do I say, we should go permissionless in this and just wild west it out and see what happens? Um, and maybe based on my phrasing, you won't be tremendously surprised to say that I don't think that's quite the right answer anyway. Uh, so health is one of those areas. I think I saw one on that chart uh, for safety because safety is the real concern. And the challenge with health goods and the market is that health goods are what we call credence goods, which means if you get sick and you take a drug and you get better, you don't really know if the drug made you better or if you would have gotten better anyway. And that's the case with a lot of health treatments. It's really hard for us as consumers and even for doctors to evaluate whether or not a particular treatment actually works or it just happened to coincide with the fact that we got better at that point in time. And so it's tough for doctors and insurers and patients and frankly, the government to know whether or not a treatment is a high quality good treatment. And that's why we have this whole FDA pre-approval regime in the first place to say we need to develop that information. We need to develop that information in some sort of systematic fashion. So what do we find as a middle ground here? Do we really think that we need one or the other of these approaches? Uh, and so innovators frequently will tell you, wow, what FDA is doing is a disaster for this type of innovation. So the, the story that really comes up uh, is the case of 23andMe, which is kind of when you get the clash of this, the, the Silicon Valley, Austin, Boston tech entrepreneur culture interacting with the DC FDA. And so 23andMe was a genetic testing company. And what they had was uh, you would sign up for their service. They'd spend you, send you a little plastic tube. Uh, you'd spit in the tube, and then you'd send it back, and they'd do some genetic tests and say, hey, you probably don't like broccoli, but you are at a slightly high risk for cancer, and here's some other stuff about you. And they totally ignored FDA. Like, really kind of, in a sense, that's funny for me on the outside, but probably not funny for them on the inside. Just wildly ignored FDA. They sent them all, FDA sent them all these letters, and they're like, whatever, not worried about it. Uh, and FDA came down on them super hard with a hammer and basically shut down a big chunk of their business um, because they said, you know, you're offering a diagnostic service, we get to say if you can do that. And you never asked us, and no, 
No, you can't, at least not without lots more information. The funny thing here, by the way, and some of you might have been thinking, well, FDA regulates medical devices. Um, are these algorithms really medical devices at all? Then the answer is the definition of what counts as a medical device is just insanely broad. Well, no value judgment. It's very, very broad. <laughs> uh, so in particular, in the 23andMe case, the reason that FDA said, here's the hook, uh, was that little plastic tube that they sent out. Well, they said, that's a sample collection device. So that's our hook. We're, we're, we're regulating you because you've got that sample collection device that you sent out. So that's a physical thing to collect a sample. Um, similarly, FDA almost certainly, although they've decided not to exercise it right now, almost certainly has the authority to regulate any iPhone that has a health app on it because it's a physical device that actually collects health data and can potentially make health information available to you. So the authority is really, really broad. broad. After Silicon Valley kind of freaked out about that, they said we're not going to, but it's there at least potentially. Uh, so, all right, entrepreneurs are really worried about this, but they're still getting into the space. FDA is unclear about what it should do, so what should it do? Well, short answer is I don't know. I wish I knew. If one of you knows, please tell me. I would like that a lot. Uh, but my thought is that what we should probably do is move towards a more flexible hybrid regime where there is some form of pre-market maybe certification, I'm thinking more on the procedural side of things, which is to say, yes, you seem like you have the kind of credentials and the kind of um, ability that we look for in actually developing these algorithms. That, of course, raises all sorts of challenges about who is allowed on the market, who gets to play. But something about, yeah, you're doing a decent job doing it, but if you try to say, does this algorithm work every time and show me the clinical trials before you let it on the market, nothing's going to get on the market. So I think we need some sort of relatively light pre-existing certification, maybe FDA, maybe third parties, maybe an underwriter's laboratory type of thing, and then really robust post-market surveillance, where we say not only are we going to use this to help direct care, but we're constantly be going to, or we're be going to collect information about how it works, how well does it work? Do people actually get better? And do we have information about whether this is a high quality product or whether it's something that's really flawed? And you know, you don't need to look hard for reasons that we want to be kind of careful about this. There was a fascinating study out maybe six months ago in I think BMJ, the British Medical Journal, now it's just BMJ, uh, that looked at insulin pumps and insulin monitoring, de monitoring devices for diabetics and found just tons and tons and tons of error in what should be a relatively simple, relatively explicit algorithm to talk about insulin dosing. So hugely crucial thing, shouldn't be wildly complicated, should be pretty explicit, tons of error anyway. So if we talk about a situation here where we're starting to really dive into the complexity of medicine and we don't actually know what's going on, we need to think, I think, pretty carefully about how we ensure that those systems are actually robust and actually high quality so that we really drive the field forward rather than getting mired in lots and lots of problems along the way. So with that, I will stop. Uh, thanks so much, and I look forward to your questions later.